it's thinking. Oh, we're live. All right, so I'm just going to change our gallery view quickly. And I think that as soon as I see us on this page, let me make sure we're live here. Okay, I can see that. So I'm going to close my Facebook and right. Hello, welcome. Thanks so much for coming and having a chat with us. Um, okay, so this is Sue Gray, everybody. For those of you who don't know Sue Gray, she is the leader. Are you co-leaders? Co-leaders, co -leaders, yeah. Okay, so co-leader of the Outdoors Party, and she's agreed so graciously to come and have a chat with us um, on 30 Plus and Fabulous to just um, sort of enlighten us a little bit about, well, a lot actually, hopefully, about policies and all that sort of thing and what they've got for us Kiwis. And also, I just wanted to say, Sue, that we... Um, uh, we decided to run this political series just because I personally could see that um, the bigger parties were they, they had a lot of exposure and mm -hmm. I felt like personally I didn't know enough about the minority parties I don't know if you call yourself minority but you know the minority parties um, and I just thought wouldn't it be nice to know more and so I just literally I just um, I tried my luck and I thought I'll see if someone wants to interview and they did, so I was like, yay, we can actually learn, you know, about the, the minority parties now. So I'm stoked to have you here. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> tell, us, tell us about yourself. Have, just tell us about yourself and what you're about. So I'm personally, I'm a lawyer. I'm self-employed. I'm based in Nelson, New Zealand. And my area of specialty is human rights, public rights, and environmental law. So working on a whole range of kind of what I call emerging issues. So I've been doing a lot on medicinal cannabis law reform and getting the hemp industry going here. Um, I've been doing a lot on, on technology, Wi-Fi in schools, and basically what we call mindful use of technology, because you know some is good, but more is not always better. Mm. Um, and on trying to get poisons out of our food. So there are some of the issues I'm really, really interested in, also holding the government to account. Yeah. Then as being I'm a lawyer, I'm a mother of three. So my oldest two are 24 and 22, living in Scotland at the moment. So it's been quite tough this year with them away with COVID and it suddenly seems like quite a big world, whereas it didn't seem so big when we could sort of jump on a plane and, and see each other. Um, and my youngest is 16, so she's had an interesting year at school with, um, she's year 12, so all the stop starts for COVID as well, although not as many as you've had in Auckland, but um, it's been hard enough down here. I think it's really sorted out the kids, the ones that can knuckle down and work from home, and it's been really tough for those who can't. Yeah, you're so, so right, because I also have a year 12 um, my son's year 12 and it's affected him actually really badly he's he's a really smart kid and he's kind of he wings his way through a lot but just being in the lock so many lockdowns he's really lost a lot of motivation and it's you know it's really hard to get it back when they they just I don't know just mm -hmm. different personalities just don't cope as well yeah yeah so so how have you, like, what's your personal thoughts about, uh, again, we agreed that we can talk about anything, but at any time, if you don't want to answer anything, that's fine as well. What, how do you feel about the lockdowns? What are, you, what are your thoughts on the so lockdowns? I, I found it really hard. It's quite odd because I work from home and I love being at home, but I normally have got a lot of kind of stress relief mechanisms where I go out and have a coffee with a friend or go and meet some clients somewhere or get out on my paddleboard and get out there and get some here and outdoors and I actually really struggle it takes the time but you know at the start I kind of well I, I before I studied um, law I actually studied science and I studied health protection so I did the same job as the kids doing the contact tracing so I, I was really interested in what they were doing and what we learned is if you serious epidemic keep everybody where they are train everybody more about the epidemic you don't have them all flying home and spreading it all over the place so I was kind of curious about why the strategy was to let everybody come back to New Zealand and mm. basically bring it with them if there was a problem so we as the outdoors part probably came to me start saying we're doing it all wrong we've actually got to lock down the country much more quickly than what we did you know, yeah. we were asking for lockdown, I think, about six weeks before the government um, did the lockdown. Mm. But then as time went on, we, I've actually gone the other way. And I said, well, actually, it's not as bad 
mm-hmm. and it's been held out to be. Mm-hmm. And we look at it, it's pretty much like a bad flu. Yeah. Um, and you don't want people to get sick. You obviously need to protect vulnerable people, but there's a lot to be said for most of us enhancing our immunity, having healthy food, getting some vitamin D from sunshine, getting into the outdoors, just feeling good about life because that actually helps your immunity. And, you know, if you get sick, you're depending on your immunity to get better anyway. We might as well do everything we can. But, so it was really odd to me that the government never seemed to even look at that side at all. They always just looked about, oh, you know, we've got to isolate everybody and we've got to wait for the vaccine. Mm, yeah. I don't know where, where you and your group are coming from, but I I studied microbiology and we learned about vaccinations. But we, the more you look into it, the more questions asked about this about what are the ingredients what testing has been done how well do they work and even if they work in the short term does it help or hinder in the long term so where i got to and where our party got to is actually we think the government's gone overboard in lockdown and we think now the cure their cure is causing more harm than the actual risk of the covid and, you know, New Zealand is a bit like being shipwrecked on, a, on our own little desert island, disconnected from the world. And it's all very well to invent basically $50 billion off the books. But along the way, somebody's going to pay for that. Yeah. And it's not paying down. Um, I guess a big concern also is it's that the money has gone out of families and small businesses into yeah. Big business. So yeah. Amazon and those guys, they they thrive for it. They've got more money than they even they don't really need the money. But you know, small family businesses that get by from week to week, you know, the hairdressers and the small business all the small businesses have really, really struggled and they've been propped up. But you can't take tips like that and you and you can't take the uncertainty. So you know this 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 so many downsides and we haven't really been talking about them we haven't been hearing about them all we've had is the daily announcement of the prime minister knows best do what you're told everything you know trust me there's only one source of truth and for me there's always more than one source of truth and it's always really important to get out there and get more information mm. and, and ask questions you know re- really what we're here for what i'm my mission in life is to ask questions because if you don't ask good questions, you don't get good answers. Yeah. yeah. So, so, we, so, so, um, you know, about so your thoughts on this lockdown, um, quite a few of the um, other parties or and people, and you know, I've, I've interviewed um, epidemiologists and um, lawyers. So you're a lawyer. I've interviewed a variety of people, and everybody seems to be saying the same thing, and that is that. Um, the you know COVID nineteen is not as as detrimental as we once thought, and and it's been um, you know it's it's known now by the is it the WHO and the CDC that, that that lockdowns aren't actually the way to go. So why is it? Tell me that um, all of the minority parties seem to be on the same page about the lockdowns, but so why are the bigger parties not? I don't get it. And because obviously mm. yeah, more from the bigger parties. So. Um, yeah. We all think that that's the truth. So. I don't get it either because if you read the research and the evidence and even the official evidence, like you say, the CDC and the World Health Organization and the international statistics, now they're talking about a second wave in England and France, but the death rate is, is almost gone. There's, there's oh, we've lost you. Oh, no. This is probably my first malfunction. So let's see if Sue comes back to us or whether we have to start. Oh, you, you, we froze for a little bit. Uh-oh. Yeah. Have you, has your internet got any special place where it likes it better? Um, I can try and go right next to it, but it's always a bit hit and miss. Yeah, I, um, I was just going to say as well, because it was, it was getting a bit robotic as well. So you're talking, I was getting a bit like... Mm. Okay, look, I'll, I'll try moving. I'll try going closer to the... Thank you. See how that goes. Just in here. Good, we're a thousand miles away from each other, eh? <laughs> amazing. How, is, it, is it okay now? That sounds good. Yeah, okay, fine. we'll try with this. Oh. Um, yeah, so that is a very good question you asked about COVID just before I froze. 
um, because we've come to the same conclusion as obviously the people you've been speaking to that when you look at the research, when you look at even the World Health Organization, the CDC, the updated information, it's not nearly as bad as they're making it out to be. Yeah. And, I mean, people call it the pandemic and, and you know, you really have to ask that. And I wonder, partly I think if you're in government, you get your official advice from certain people yeah. and you tend not to listen to other people. Mm. So, um, I mean, I've worked in government, I know what it's like, and they only listen to people who are going to give them the advice that they want to hear. So it's quite dangerous mm. that you don't get often diverse ranges of advice. And so they're probably getting advice. Everybody they're talking to is saying, what's oh, terrible, it's terrible, we've got to have a lockdown. But if they listen to other people, they would get different advice and they might start to question it. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is because of the international agreements that New Zealand is party to, they're basically obligated to act in a certain way um, with banking arrangements and finance arrangements and, and all of these agreements. And so they sometimes aren't actually, sadly, acting for New Zealanders, they're acting for the people that are financing them and the corporations that they've got agreements with. Um, and I personally am really concerned about that. That's one of the issues the Outdoors Party would look really um, closely into about these agreements. Are they actually for the good of New Zealand? Because why would we be parties to, to agreements that aren't good for our people? Do um, the agreements that you're talking about, do they have names? There, is there anything that you can... Yeah, well, there's the, um, there's the UN Agenda 2020 and 2030 agreements. So they... they if you read the front part of the front page it all sounds great you know it's all about sustainable development and they're, they're lovely words but what i've learned through law and through politics more recently is it's some of it is double speak and they tell you lovely words but actually the lovely word has got a sort of hidden meaning that they that people in the system know but they it doesn't mean that to everybody else and it's only when you sort of crack the code of what's going on that you understand better what they're really saying. So some of so some of those agreements seem to be taking us down a path. And what concerns me is that our Prime Minister is is kind of a bit of a bit of a, a, a star on the international stage. And it feels at times that she's more worried about maintaining her international star status than doing what's good for us here in New Zealand. Okay. So is that is that like is that how you feel or is that like really what, what it really ultimately looks like um, based on what you know in your studies and statistically, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what you know, you know, like actual statistically, because, um, you know, like I, I sort of am hearing two sides of the argument here and um, lots of people absolutely, absolutely love um, and adore Jacinda um, and feel like she's kept us so safe and, you know, there's, mm. there's that category of people and um, they want her to have another chance because they think you know what what could she do now that the you know the foot's off her throat sort of sort of thing like she's been limited so they want her to have you know another three years because it, you know would be able to see what she could really do then but then on the other flip side of it there's people who are saying that um, it really does line up to something that's happening from an outside source and and really if you look into it like you know you're talking about the UN agenda um, if you look into it, it kind of what's happening in New Zealand and like you said, all of those banking um, finance, finance places and all that sort of lines up to us becoming quite suppressed as a country. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it's, it's scary to say that out loud, say that they might have an alternative motive because they're Kiwis, they're supposed to love us. So what? Mm -hmm. It's really scary to say it out loud. And it, it's quite, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that we've been told. Sorry, I've lost it, Sue. Sorry, um, we're losing the audio. Can, can you hear now? I've a little bit. Right. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of um, red flags. When we're told not to ask questions and when we're told that there is only one truth and the only truth is the government's official line and we're told not to do our own research, that is all red flag warnings for me but it's also a warning for people that have lived in countries like Germany, 
and Zimbabwe and South Africa where they don't really have human rights. And they were the type of things that happened when their regime was almost turning into a tyranny, when they were losing their democracy. So whether it's the intent of what the government's doing or not, I think it's the effect. The effect of, of have only one line of information is a really, really dangerous thing for any government to say to its people. Mm. So what's really happened now with the uh, minor parties is interesting. Actually, we, like you said, we hardly get any publicity compared to the big parties. But mm -hmm. we've arranged a few of our own debates some, with some of the minor parties and that sort of thing. We've had some awesome debates. And we actually had this COVID question in a debate that we had in Nelson with the one party. Um, uh, we had New Conservative and we had um, Advance and me for the Outdoors Party. And quite independently, we'd all come to the same sort of um, principles outcome on COVID. So how can it be that four parties that haven't been working together on this at all, but have all read the same research, um, one of the candidates was a medical doctor, so he was really he had good expertise in the area. I'm a lawyer and I do a lot of human rights law, so I've got some expertise in that area. Another was human relations and another was a businessman. So four different backgrounds, but all coming to very much the same conclusion. And I thought that was quite an aha sort of a moment that we're not all stupid, we're not all conspiracy theorists, we're just reasonable people that want a really good outcome for, for our children and for our future. And how can it be that the government's gone off in one direction and yet all four of us have come to a completely different conclusion? Mm. So that's funny you use the word conspiracy theorist because um, actually every other, again, minority that I've interviewed, they've all said something along the same lines that when they when they do start talking out, you know, in a slightly different narrative to the current government, that they immediately get tarred with a brush of conspiracy theorists. What, what does that mean? What does conspiracy theorists mean? When you're all governmental parties, what does it mean for, you know, four or five of you to be conspiracy and, and two or three of you to be the only source of truth? What does that mean? Well, I think what it means is that the establishment don't like people challenging them. And it's very convenient for them to label new parties as being weird and dangerous and thinking because we think and we ask questions and we've got nothing to lose we're not trying to defend what our colleagues have been doing for the last 5 10 20 years in, in our case in nelson our mp's been there for 30 years we've got nothing to defend we're only getting involved i mean there's no if i had have known how hard it would be getting involved i probably wouldn't have done it but it's been a really interesting learning curve that you you make all this time to go to all these meetings and, and answer questions and do everything because you care and yeah. there's no real reward there's there's probably no prospect of getting elected but all you can do is hope that you get people asking better questions and thinking about things that they wouldn't otherwise think about and talking about issues that need to be talked about but that the establishment parties won't even talk about unless we force them to talk about those questions mm. so, so because we are inconvenient, we tend to be labelled conspiracy theorists. But it's really odd for me because as a lawyer, I mean, I, I've been in the High Court well, this year, I've been in the Supreme Court twice last year, so the highest level of courts. So I'm the lawyer in New Zealand that is everybody wants for medicinal cannabis cases because I've been focusing on those cases and got pretty much every client discharged without conviction. So I've got a great record as a lawyer and yet same person same kind of thinking stand up in politics and I'm told I'm a conspiracy theorist yeah and I, I find that really kind of it's a it's a really trick hard concept but so um the outdoors party how long have you been an established party yeah so the outdoors party started just before the last election got registered just a few weeks before okay. Yeah. And there were only four candidates in the last election. Um, and then after the election, we had a bit of a rejig because at the start it was more just focused on outdoors things, whereas we decided we needed to be more kind of wide ranging on what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And we're much more into health and agriculture and, and sort of communities connecting with nature, into mm -hmm. education and into justice, because what happened this year was um, COVID, justice and freedom 
and rights and, and basically getting a constitution for New Zealand, a people's constitution has become, we believe, really, really important. Mm, yeah. So we're evolving and we're pretty much crowdsourcing everything. You know, we've got no big stash of money, no bankers behind us or anything. It's all about people saying, hey, yeah, we need something different. And they're coming and sharing their ideas with us. And we've got teams of people working on different policies to try and really bring back New Zealand in a way that's really good to have kids, your families grow up, just just the kind of Kiwiana kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm, I'm scared of um, my kids losing the good old Kiwi life and I, I do kind of see that sort of creeping in now and, um, you know, that does worry me. Um, but it, again, every time I have conversations with all these different um, parties, I find that we're, we're talking about the same thing here. Everybody just wants the best for their kids and everybody just wants the best for, you know, New Zealand. And But again, coming back to that question, isn't that what the top, you know the big you know the well-paid parties <laughs> isn't that what they want for us as well is it well it should be what they want for us because they're representing us but i think what's happened is they've got so many corporate sponsors that it's distorted their thinking and their advocacy even for my work so as a lawyer with say medicinal cannabis if i'm acting for a sick person or if i'm acting for a green parent Sorry, your audio is going again sorry i wonder why it's doing that can you hear me now yep. so if i'm acting for a sick person or if i'm acting for a green theory who's basically illegally making cheap medicinal cannabis products yeah there's no way in the world i can get a meeting with the government wow. but if i'm working for an overseas corporate that wants to come and invest 10 million dollars in new zealand i can get a meeting within a week wow and so, and I know from personal experience, it happens. It, it happens all the time. So it's just the way the system is set up that it's very focused on big and powerful, and it doesn't give nearly as much regard to just individuals. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you think that um, the minority parties can do? Like, so, so for example, what would you be aiming for? No, like you just said before that you know um, the chances of being in government are what. Are they good? I, I'm not sure much about this. Uh, look, I don't know, but um, I mean, I, I'd like to think I've got a decent chance in Nelson because I've grown up here. I've done a lot of legal work for people. I've helped all sorts of different communities in Nelson with, with all sorts of different issues, but you actually don't know until the day people vote who they're going to vote for. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, but, but what we would, the best thing we could do is get new ideas into the system and we've already had a lot of our policies picked up by other parties and people's so we we've, we've been talking about regenerative agriculture you know let's farm with nature instead of farming with monsanto and chemicals oh yeah yeah and, you know thriving soils get the carbon back into the soil get get healthy foods growing without all the sprays this horrible idea of spraying food with roundup just before it's harvested so that it's easy to harvest but without any consideration about the health effect on the food you know why would any government condone that? Mm. That's a really big thing for us. And, it, and we're, we're very pro-farmer. We're pro-family farmer doing kind of meat to meat things with their farm. We're not pro-massive corporate dairy farmers that are just trying to get as much out of the farm as they can, you know? Let's be smarter and let's recognise small is beautiful and let's have like local you know, farmers markets. We've got a brilliant one in Nelson and there's a lot of really good ones around the country where people can get together and trade their products and learn about each other, what they're growing. And someone can say, oh, you know, did you think about growing this? And, oh, no, but I'll give it a go. And, you know, we'll kind of learn off each other and make local decisions for local people. So we've been talking about this for a good five, six, six months to a year now. But other parties are starting to talk about those things as well, which is which is great. So whether we get in or not, if we sort of planted the seed of the idea, we're happy. I'm happy. Um, you know, if you personally do get a seat. What what are you? What are the policies that are really important? I mean, all of them would be. But what are your focus policies? What are the things you really want to drive in and make a difference on? Um, one thing is health. 
at the moment it's all ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and you know the health system's okay if you break your arm or, or have a heart attack or something but the, the amount of chronic ill health is awful and the mental ill health I can't believe in a country like New Zealand where what has happened why why is it you know whenever I talk to young people the first issue that comes up it's either mental health or housing or mental health and housing mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like people have really lost hope for the future yeah. um so our idea of health is to turn the whole thing inside out back to front and let's focus on on wellness keeping people well so you know physical wellness but mental spiritual and environmental mm. and so let's stop poisoning the environment let's stop you know cell towers everywhere outside kids bedroom windows and let's start thinking about what we need to thrive Mm. And, and let's start managing all of those kind of ill health problems before they become problems for everybody rather yeah. than you know kind of fix them afterwards yeah it's it's a big job though eh? like because i mean if you think about statistically even um thinking about cancer it's sort of like one and two now and i mean so it's a it would be a massive thing to rewind like where would you even start well, I think you start by just getting people talking about it and saying, well, why has one in two of New Zealanders got cancer? We never used to all have cancer. What are we doing differently? Oh, could it be all the strays on our food? Could it be all the radiation? Could it be all the pharmaceuticals? What is it that's causing the problem? Let's, let's actually go back to basically common sense, simple, natural solutions to things. And, you know, it's never going to be an instant cure. But at the moment, I mean, people now have got, that are born now have got a lesser life expectancy than we had when we were born. Mm. And isn't that just outrageous mm. when all the technology and medicine and whatever is actually, we're actually killing ourselves faster than we're saving ourselves. So we're on the wrong path. Um, with, with the whole COVID thing, it could have been a good chance. Like, like we were talking about COVID and I found it actually quite distressing losing my ability to get out and get out on my paddle board and burn off a bit of stress i actually found it really stressful but i did like some of it i could jump on my bike and the roads were empty and that was really cool so you know a lot of people say the same sort of thing so why don't we learn from these things and say well it's really unsustainable to keep going the way we've been going we're going to have to change the way we do things why don't we start Choosing about what we do want rather than rather than just kind of carrying on down a path that we know is not good for us and we're all stressed out, our kids are stressed out, you know, kids on like pre teens are on, you know, antidepressants and anti anxiety drugs. What is going on? And let's, you know, let's peel back those problems and, and try and make some better choices for ourselves. Mm. Do you think um, that this current government and all of the um, you know parties that are at the bigger parties and um, how they're kind of going along with this um, sustainability thing, which you know you called um, Agenda 2021, 20, 2030? Um, do you think that they think that they're doing, you know, they're going to make life better for everybody by going along this agenda? But actually, it's sort of like you said, the ambulance at the bottom of the hill. It's going to make things fundamentally worse. Yeah, I don't even know if they put two and two together. You know, I just think that they get it. If you don't go into the system with a pretty clear understanding of its modus operandi, it's easy to get sort of bogged down by, and you've got all these advice papers and people telling you this and people telling you that, and you don't probably have time to stop and think and learn. Mm. I think one of the things we've got with the Outdoors Party is no career politicians. They're all people that have got expertise in their own field, whether it's in the health field or the agriculture field or, or law and justice or just outdoors hunting, fishing, tourism. But they're all experts in their own field. So they've all got a pretty good handle on, on what we're talking about. You know, we've got um, teachers that have written our education policies and they've written them because they don't like the way education is going. They think that education should be much more individualised so that kids can learn in a way that suits their personality and their needs rather than, you know, testing, okay, you're at this age, you've got to have this test, you've got to be able to do these things. It's, 
so I think it, if you've got an expertise in an area, you, you're, you're in a good place to inform your own decision making and challenge challenge the bureaucrats but if you're you know if you've been a, a funeral director and you're now the minister of health well you probably don't have very good skills for questioning them yeah so <laughs> oh that's that is classic so um yes on that point i had a, a, a chat with a farmer a dairy farmer so i saw her her post went viral so she was from bristol grove farms and i had a chat with her and we talked about you know how you know she, she said the government's brought out this new law and it's really going to hurt them the farmers and all they ever wanted was just a chance to you know to, they want to be um healthy um you know contributing farmers to you know decent waterways and all that sort of thing she said but they would not even have a conversation with them they could not get a consultation so she mm -hmm. said effectively it was these career politicians around a table with their coffees deciding what's the best way forward for these farmers without consultation so do you feel like that could be sort of like a you know does that sort of ripple through the whole of all of these issues where See it? And, look, sadly, it does. Look, my experience is if you can sit around a table with a group of people with a whole lot of different perspectives and sort of whiteboard all of the issues and concerns, you can pretty much always come up with a good answer. Yeah. The, the problem is when only one group are represented and they're often the sort of corporate perspective and they sit down with their perspective but not all the other perspectives, they come out with an answer that suits them but not everybody else. So that, that um, you know, also spells out a lack of democracy in a country that is supposed to be democratic. What's happening there, in your, in your opinion? It's a disaster. Look, it's great. I've just been on, on um, I, was, I went to an electoral meeting last night and I wasn't allowed to speak because only four main parties were allowed to speak. And it was the Nelson Weekly newspaper. So they're supposed to be part of the fourth stage of sharing information and, and education about the digital process. But no, they chose their winners and the other candidates were excluded. And that's just one of so many examples of, of the whole electoral process is really dodgy, but democracy itself is just, it, it's an aspect way. We, we have a Bill of Rights in New Zealand, but it's a very fragile Bill of Rights because any law can change it. So, <laughs> What's the Bill of Rights if it can be changed like that? Exactly, exactly. And all they have to do is they have to report to say, oh, this is going to breach the Bill of Rights, but we think it's justified because of whatever and whatever. Mm. And you've got one perspective saying we think it's justified. Look, so what one of the projects we want to do is get a New Zealand People's Bill of Rights. So Sorry, I'm just losing your audio a bit again. Just need to... Um, um, get a, can you hear now? I don't know why it does that. I'm not even moving or anything. <laughs> your laptop muffled on your tummy or your chest. That's what I feel like happens yeah. Is that yeah. working now? Yeah. Right, okay, I'll hold it up. But, um, yeah, so we want to, to have a public input into what the public thinks should be in our Bill of Rights, in our protected rights. But we also then want to have like public juries so that if the government wants to pass a law or act in a way that's inconsistent with the Bill of Rights, instead of it going to the government system, we think it should come to the people's jury for the people to decide mm -hmm. if the Bill of Rights has been breached or not. And if the people decide that that law is not okay, then it can't become a law. So yeah. really, it's all about giving the power back to the people, yeah. because that is what government is supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be representing the people, not representing themselves and not representing because they've done agreements with different countries or whatever. You know, that, that's not their job. Their job is to represent us. So yeah. how how is it that, I mean, so you said that the Bill of Rights, even though, you know, it may not be in the Bill of Rights, they can justify it. So if they're justifying one thing after the other, which is what I am mm -hmm. seeing happening, um, that then becomes what? If it's not democracy, what is it? Well, it's almost a tyranny, isn't it? It's a government that thinks it knows better than the people that it's representing. And, you know, step by step, it's a bit like you put a frog in the warm water and you gradually heat the water up until it's boiling and the frog dies, but the frog doesn't notice because it's just happening very slowly. 
And that's really what's been happening to our democracy. We've We've got, we're supposed to have checks and balances to protect the democracy so the different branches of government keep an eye on each other. But sadly, what we've got in New Zealand is really they're all kind of one and the same. So we elect our representatives, but then they become the ministers of the town. So, you know, they're not really checking out each other's behaviour because they're kind of all part of the same. And then even with our judiciary in New Zealand, most countries have an independent panel to choose their judges. But in New Zealand, it all goes through the same sort of processes. So it's the town law and the attorney general who are choosing our judges. So even then, you know, there's a very real risk that they would choose judges who represent the views of the government rather than represent or uphold the law. Mm. So I'm not saying that the judges don't uphold the law, but I'm saying if the judges want to be promoted, they're going to be mindful of the people that have their future career in their hands, which are the government. So we don't really have much in the way of independence here at all. It's, it's, and we, you know, we just have one parliament, they can change the law on a 51% vote. Um, whereas most countries, if you want to change a sort of a significant law, you would have to have maybe a 75% vote or an 80% vote. But mm -hmm. we, we are, ours is all just kind of here today, gone tomorrow, here's the next one. And it, it's very fragile. Yeah, so. I think that's when I first started noticing that I wanted more information was um, during the uh, first lockdown. It was, uh, I was seeing a whole lot of um, bills being passed really, really quick. Well, without, without my consent, how come they did not consult me on this? You know, but <laughs> I, I like some of them were like, how did I miss that? Like, why did how did that happen without me hearing about I don't watch TV so I don't see mm. all the 1 pm mm. or any of that um so you know I'm like how did I miss that that's unfair that felt unfair so I started you know that's when I started my initial journey of trying to figure out what was going on and then I started um thinking uh, how come I'm not like I'd hear a lot of um I guess what you call conspiracy stories about the different minority parties and I was like how can all of these parties be so wretched and the only good ones are these ones that we hear from all the time so that's that's initially because i you know i'm like one of i am a very skeptical person i i i am always i just have a, that's probably a flaw in my personality but i'm very skeptical so I just was like, what's going on here? I want to know. Um, so I thought, let's start digging a little bit deeper. And I have found that upon all of these different conversations, I'm hearing a completely different narrative. I'm hearing all of these different um, parties who love New Zealand, absolutely love and want the best for New Zealand. And if they are all, you know, you know, you're all separate parties, but you're all very much in agreement on a lot of different you know topics yep. so if you guys are all in agreement but you don't actually work side by side how is it that we the people out here in New Zealand are hearing just this one story just this one narrative mm. so you know it is a little bit scary because there are so many people out there who are just devout about who they're going to vote for and I think it's because it's what they've mainly heard through mainstream media yeah. I think you can divide it largely. The people that get most of their advice from TV and mainstream media have one view, which is that the government are very good and they know what they're doing and they uh, can be trusted and don't even need to ask any questions. Whereas yeah. the people that get most of their information from their own research, from whatever sources it may be, tend to have come to a completely different conclusion that the government is off on a, a agenda of its own and they're not representing us very well. Oh, we've lost you again. Just going to wait here for a second, see if we get you back. Hello. Oh, we've lost you. Are you back? <laughs> I can hear you. Is that, can you... Oh, I thought I'd just wait and see if you unfreeze. Yeah. Yep. I, is that good? I can. I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so I was just saying, the, um, if you take most of your advice from TV and mainstream media, you tend to have one view. If you do your own research, you tend to have a completely different view. Mm. And, and look, you know, we are all human. We're, we're entitled to have different perspectives. So I just 
only tell is only one answer. That's a red flag to thinking anyone in my view. Like, so audio, audio again, sorry, shuffle, <laughs> just a shuffle. Yeah. Okay, try, try that now. <laughs> We'll, we'll get there. We'll make it. Good arm exercise, holding this thing up. <laughs> Have you got a book or something that you want to, do you want to grab? Uh, I, it's okay, look, I've tried on here. Is You're it, right. Yep, is that, how's that now like that? On this, uh, like, like this kind of interview, you might as well just shuffle around until you find your right position. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, well, we'll, we'll try out, we'll try now. Is that okay? Yep. Can you, as long as you can hear me. Yep, start. sounds fine yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so the people that do their own research, and, and it is so interesting how you start to get quite skeptical of the mainstream and what we're being told. And the more you research, the more skeptical you get because it's a completely different version of the truth mm. when you get into your own research and from a very credible source. I mean, I, I look at Google, but I look at Google Scholar, I look at scientific papers, I look at um, I'm part of the world. Uh, global 5G lawyers, so talking about mindful use of technology. So we've got a network all around the world to share the best information that we can get. I'm on the um, Australasian um, also, which is uh, what is the Oceania um, for radiation research. So with scientists from all around the world advising for Australia and New Zealand, I've got access to some amazing people. And, and the position that we come to is so different than what our government is coming to. And I can only say that if you're, if you're looking for the best interest of the people, you come up with a very different outcome than if you're looking for the best interest of the corporation. Mm. That's the dividing line. That's a good point. Mm. So if, we, if we're calling it, you know, for what it looks like, what, what's the um, incentive for a government to be operating in that way and not in a democratic way? What's what's the incentive for them to do that? Maybe. I mean, look, I personally, when I, I did work in the fishing industry and it was really well known that, say, New Zealand first were getting massive donations from fishing companies. Wow. And it, and it looks like that's been continuing. Um, and so they go into a lecture election saying we will um, put much more protection for recreational fishing so that local New Zealanders can catch fish again which would be great which is one of our policies let's put the fish back in fishing and back on people's tables instead of all being scooped out by massive fishing vessels exported to overseas and we can't even afford it you know I mean it's, it's, it's crazy but so they go into the election saying that they're going to do that but once they get in, they're never going to do it because they're getting funding from the corporate fishers, the commercial fishers, to protect their interests. So, you know, th there's, there's all sorts of perverse incentives that shouldn't be happening. You know, our view is political parties should only be able to get funding from voters. Mm. Because if you're a corporation, you, you shouldn't have a vote and you shouldn't be able to donate to a political party. If you're an overseas person, you don't have a vote in New Zealand, you shouldn't be able to donate. So as an elected representative, you're representing people, real real live living people who have got hopes and needs and expectations. You should be 100% representing them and nobody else. Mm. Mm. But, but that's not how it works at the moment. You know, it's, it's really sad, but it's not how it works. So do you think... Um, do you think it's more to do with the fact that um, the, the bigger parties are getting more airtime and more um, buy-in because of the airtime? Or is it um, because people are genuinely scared and they just mm. want to look after? I don't really know. I think um, I put up a post today and I said, I wonder who would people would vote for if all politicians got it and candidates got equal media coverage and resourcing yeah. wouldn't it be interesting to see what effect it's had because most people don't go beyond red or blue and you know it's actually they're very similar you yeah. know they're yeah. different space and a different color but right. they're all basically acting for the corporate they're they're not looking they're not innovative and it's the same with business you know the most innovative business are the small new businesses that 
they have to come up with something amazing to get started and survive. Yeah. And after a while, they get lazy and they get, you know, a, you're not, a, not as creative. Same with politicians. Mm -hmm. If you've been doing the same job for 30 years, you're not going to be, if you haven't done it now, you're probably not going to do it in the next three years either. So politicians can get lazy and voters can get lazy and um, complacent, maybe, I suppose you'd call it. Um, so in my um, voting history, I've never been as interested in politics as I am now. And probably even um, just at the lockdown or the last three years has been very interesting, hasn't it? Um, but before that, I was just a red or blue as well. I'd be like, OK, who's doing what? You know, OK, red, blue. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about any of the other parties and nor did I try and find anything out and I wasn't really that heavily invested in it either like I didn't have much I didn't have any key factor whether one or the other one and it might just come down to one single policy that I'm like oh no I don't like that and then I just flip over and and change to the other um so um you know I just feel like really we need like you said there's not enough um ear time for the minority parties there's just not enough I don't think that people can make a, a an educated decision because we just don't have enough information you would need these kinds of chats probably every single day to even try and get out there and have enough you know people seeing your you know your that well the actual party and what they stand for and and how do you do that like it just feels like it does feel like a very unlevel playing field. It so, is, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also New Zealanders are not very literate in terms of oh. politics. Um, my eldest daughter, well, she lives in Edinburgh now, but when she was in year 13, she did a student exchange to Germany for six months. And she was, she was, first of all, she was astonished because she thought that she knew German. And then she, when she got there, it was like, whoa, this German's really hard. <laughs> But she was amazed because over there, all of the kids are into politics and into human rights and into discussions about all sorts of different issues. Whereas here, she didn't know anybody that had those conversations at school. And then she, she was, so she went to school there for six months and then she went to Spain and au pair for the rest of the year. And then she came back to New Zealand. She said, Mum, everyone's still just kind of talking about TV shows and, you know, and, and it's just, kind of not being part of our culture to really get aware of all these things I think. Um, We've just been a sleepy safe um, complacent mm -hmm. country and we really have been pretty safe for such a long time eh? what happened? How did this yeah. happen? Well, well it's basically we're ripe for a corporate takeover basically. Um, New Zealand uh, one thing that I'm aware of from my work with the ACC law because we can't sue for personal injury we're a very great testing ground for companies that want to try out new technologies and drugs and chemicals and whatever on us because if it doesn't work and a whole lot of people get sick, we can't sue them. If they tested them in America, you know, they'd have to pay millions of dollars compensation to everyone who was harmed. So we're a dream testing ground because we're really easy going and we don't complain much and we just kind of go with the flow. And if it all turns to custard, we can't do anything much anyway. So we're like the crash test dummies of the world, it sounds like. Wow, marvellous. Wow, that sounds fun. Um, so um, I just don't really, um, I, I don't really know the way forward for us then, because if we have only these big parties that people are hearing about and the minorities are not maybe getting out there as much, or like, can the minorities, is there any way they can work together or is there any? Yeah. We definitely, look, we're, we're increasingly talking about that. It's probably too late for the election now. But what I say to people is, if in doubt, vote different. Vote for something different because any different voice yeah. at least throws some other ideas into the mix and at least challenges the status quo. Because at the moment, National and Labour aren't even challenging each other. They're, they're, they're just frittering around the edges. But if even one MP that ask good questions in Parliament could make a massive difference. And if we had half a dozen from different parties, it would be even better. It would be great. So we can actually get different perspectives and different issues on the table. So that would be ideal. But even without that, I think what's happening is we are getting a people's movement where we are getting, people are waking up and saying, hang on, what is going on here? This is not the New Zealand we grew up in. This is not what we want for our kids. We are losing 
so many rights and so many freedoms and we're not being asked all this kind of idea of nationalizing decision making and oh don't don't worry about asking everybody they don't know what they're talking about that is not okay you know um so i mean my ideal world we would have a little um technical revolution and we would claim back some of our little special places you know there's a few towns around new zealand like raglan and gold and golden bay and you know places where people are thinking and people are actually asking the question and you know wouldn't it be great if they took their own power back and mm. they said we don't want to be just part of this big blah new zealand um where we get no say we actually are special and we've got our own values and we want you know we want to be organic and we want to be making decisions on all these different things um so uh, the way I see it heading is, is down that path of sort of localism. Like we, we've we've been too nationalised. Now is the time for it to go back the other way. But I don't think National and Labour are going to hand that back to us. We're only going to get those rights back if we stand up and demand them back. Wow. And, you know, we keep asking questions. And so, what, so what does that look like? Demanding that back. What is that impact? <laughs> People asking their MP questions, asking their council questions. You can ask questions under the Official Information Act. So um, the government basically holds the information for us. So if we ask for it, they have to give it to us. And it's incredible what you find when you actually ask questions. Mm. Um, but also just, I, I mean, just the idea of sitting around a big bonfire at night with a whole lot of different people, just like in sort of tribal places, and, talking about what we want mm. because you know if we don't talk about what we want and what's important it all kind of gets frittered away mm. i'm i'm definitely one of those um sit around the you know have a have a wine or two and and um, i always end up um, bringing the politics to the table with my group and it's like oh sorry i said i wasn't going to do this tonight, but i am so sorry about that um because i just think we've hit a, a brick wall in terms of um uh, we we need I feel like we need some drastic change or some yeah. drastic clog in the wheel it, um it's almost like we need a train we need a train wreck to happen we need something to just mm -hmm. explode so that we can go right now what do we want to do how do we want to put this back together yeah. uh, I um have always been pretty vocal that I'm not you know I don't intend to vote for any of the big parties but that's just because values don't align with um, I don't align with their values and some of the things you know quite a lot of the things actually um, but I'm really struggling because the minority parties have so or all of them have so many good policies and so many amazing things I'd like to choose four people to vote for sort of thing you know that that's mm. That's not like um, that's how I would be. So that's that's I guess what you're talking about—a movement of people who say we demand change. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I guess the parties have got to start finding as much common ground as they can. But the people, the more the people stand up and say it, and you know, there's all sorts of things that I've spoken at Luminate Festival and Golden Bay a few times, and you just get a real hub of thinking people that are open to all sorts of ideas and there's lots of those festivals around New Zealand but there, there are kind of times when the right people come together and you feel that you can really make some progress in thinking but then what we've got to do well the other thing we can do and I've been talking about it at meetings is actually we can do quite a lot ourselves we've got to stop expecting the government to be the sort of knight that comes galloping through the horizon and saving us and start thinking about how we can save ourselves, what we can actually do in our own lives to make things as good as we can possibly make them. And, and you know, like I, this would be going down a rabbit hole completely, but I would think things like um, being able to learn how to grow our own food in the backyard and getting back into that community sharing, here, you have my mm -hmm. letter, I'll have your yeah. be that sort of thing would be awesome but then if this UN agenda is being driven in I, I know definitely I have looked into that Monsanto thing and and it sounds like they want to um, get to a place where they're creating single seed harvest so that mm. means that being owned by Monsanto you wouldn't even be able to grow your own garden um, without sort of being at their peril so I don't know this whole thing feels really really it almost feels surreal I've had this conversation mm. People, the times we're in and and the you know the the political environment we're in right now feels like a sci-fi movie it feels surreal yeah. 
and it and I think it is. I think that's where it's heading. But see, even with that, we can do things. So I've been doing a series of interviews at the Nelson Market with some of the people that are doing really cool things there. Um, you know, guy with his bokashi and fermented fruits and uh, vegetables and things, and then um, another guy with the seed, heritage seed. So I now buy all of my seeds from the heritage seed man because you can actually pick your own seeds and plant them and you get away from this whole Monsanto um, one crop, you know, thing. But that's something we can do. So if we even start to make small choices for good things, that all starts to build up. You know, hey, five million New Zealanders, if we all stop supporting Monsanto and we stop supporting the big pharma and we stop supporting the, the overseas companies that rip us off and we start buying local and supporting our neighbours and caring and building communities, we actually build an amazing quality of life and we build our self-sufficiency and resilience and all of the things. And the government so far can't really stop us doing those things. Like we, that's our own choices and we can take that focus those, those things. Mm. It's just been a bit more organised, you know, like it's kind of easy to go to the supermarket and buy everything, but it's just, just it's actually a lot more fun to go to the market and, you know, support local. Mm. I would love that. I would definitely love that old lifestyle. But again, I think we've just um, become the microwave generation and everything needs to be quick. And, you know, even for me, I'm like, wow, how did I, you know, literally, how did I end up with a microwave in my house? Because I didn't have one until um, a few months ago. And in fact, my son mm -hmm. hounded me and hounded me until I got it for him. Um, and I'm like, how did I get to this? Because you're trying to be everything for everyone and mm -hmm. society's got so fast and you just jump into the fast lane and you just get mowed down. Yeah. So like we want to get off, you want to get off the escalator. I had the most amazing experience. I traveled in Asia for about nine months just backpack by myself. And um I did more and more brave things, I guess, as I kind of got in the flow. And I ended up staying in this little village in Rajasthan. It was like really conservative like it was the most amazing experience I've ever had and the men didn't even speak to the woman there but I was kind of okay because I was an alien so I didn't like fit in their boxes but we had this great conversation they go well you know it must be so dirty in in the western countries and it's like well why is this oh well, you know how could the woman possibly have time to work because it takes all day to collect the water and grow the flower and build the build the fire and do all those things, you know. And they they obviously they didn't need um, electricity or a fridge or any kind of no they, they just couldn't imagine like try explaining a vacuum cleaner to people that have got cow dung on their floor, like really beautiful, shiny, like varnished because they sweep it so much. But it's like, it's just such a different paradigm. But, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. I wouldn't quite go back that far, but there's a lot to be said for just taking time to smell the roses and appreciating mm. all the simple things. Mm. Uh, it, um, it concerns me, though, that we, you know, like even particularly our kids, it's a whole different generation, our devices and all that sort of thing. I don't feel like, it's almost like you don't feel like you could take them back to that place anyway, even if you wanted to. But mm. um, I don't know. I was also thinking about the whole socialist thing that they say that it's being driven into New Zealand. Even if we did have socialism and even if they did try and put us into like a welfare state and even if we all had to be, um, you know, very close neighbours or whatever, you know we could still like you said there's always still something you can do you know you can always still grow things and make things and it's it really is um the people's choice what they allow to happen isn't it it is it is but you know we should not agree to lose our freedoms the whole thing about being a human is that we can choose we're not all kind of units of currency that that yeah. you know we, yeah. we've all got different amazing ideas and schools you ask 10 kids to draw a picture of a dog and they'll all draw a completely different picture and that's it's a great thing yeah. It, it's um yeah i just think we we lose a lot of our humanity when we go down this sort of futures path but at least if we're mindful i guess at least if we 
we're aware of what we're doing and we're conscious about our choices. I think that's a really important thing. And we don't just do it without even thinking. And then how do we get here? So like you said, cooking the frog. I'm just going to um, now look at a few questions that some of the girls on the page are asked. Oh, we've had an awesome discussion, but we probably haven't touched on lots of policies, but that's all right. Um, so I'm just going to ask some of their questions. So they want to know um, what what are um, the, what's the outdoors party, um, what are their policies on housing? Okay, so our idea for housing is that Audio. I'll just move it around and cut. Is it okay now? Good arm workout. Okay, good for me. Um, yeah. Um. So, because people need a good place to live. Yeah. We 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 are. Supporting more intensive housing in the inner city, so the smaller, um, so people could walk and travel around to avoid the, the sort of transport problems and the lack of housing. But we think that you know you equally you should be able to live in the countryside in a, you know ten houses on one block and and sort of a communal type lifestyle. Mm. You know things suit different people. Yeah. Um, we we support the idea of government buying land and letting people build their own house and having basically a free rent for a period of time, maybe five years or whatever, and then gradually coming up to pay a market rent, but to get people into their own homes yes. in a more affordable way. Yeah. Um, and, and that way it's kind of a, an intermediate between a state home that's not yours, but if it's your, your own home, you can design your home, you can do everything about it, it's totally yours, it's mm. just that you, you um, lease the land for the first time. Yeah. So just, and just a whole lot more innovation. You know, we love the idea of hemp homes and, and different materials. And, you know, we don't, we just think it's crazy that our pine trees are mono monoculture, first felled, exported overseas, and then we have to import logs, timber back into the country still. I mean, we've gone, we've lost the pot. It's very backward, isn't it? It's like we've 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 done some pretty dreadful things to our land, and we haven't made the best use of our land and or our farming, or like we really are ripping ourselves off, aren't we? Yeah, it's raping our land. We're getting all of the harm, and the benefit is being exported overseas, and that's just insanity for a society to let that keep happening. Mm -hmm. I yeah. saw. I saw a picture the other day of um, some um, fish processed, you know, like patties or something that had been um, fished from New Zealand, obviously processed in China, brought back to New Zealand and sold as fish patties. It's like, mm. what is that? <laughs> what is that? And it's just, it's just again, the creep, like the frog. It's, it's, you know, they think it might be a little bit cheaper, but in the long term, isn't it better to give people jobs and, you know, the whole, well, we've, we've got a policy of, of reviewing the whole commercial fishing thing because at the moment it's great for a few very big companies, but all of the local fishermen are out of business. You know, it, it's, it's all become so centralised into just a few, whereas we used to have thriving little fishing ports all around New Zealand. And, and we need to have a look at how we can get that back again. And things like um, Kawai, is being exported, I think it was like under a dollar a kilo for use as fish bait in, that, in, in Australia. And yet we go to the supermarket and what the cheapest you can buy fish for is like $25 a kilo or something. So it's completely unaffordable for New Zealanders and yet it should be one of our healthy, readily available food. So yeah, there's, there's just so much that has gone wrong because I think the decision making has been pointing in the wrong direction. Yeah. So again, back to the whole career politicians making decisions on behalf of the actual frontline workers. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And with the workers too, like we think workers should be treated fairly, but best of all, let's make it easy to run business. Let's get rid of all that bureaucracy and red tape that puts people off. Mm. Because a lot of people like could easily run a business to supplement their lifestyle. Yeah. And 
then they're not totally dependent on what wages they're being paid because then they can actually break free of that whole thing and become much more independent. Mm. You know, Asia and I was saying at an immigrant meeting the other day, you go to Asia and it starts raining and within five minutes there are people selling umbrellas on the corner and then the oh, sun No, it's unreal. Yeah, then they're selling sun glasses and then it's hot and they're selling water and you know, we don't have that sort of innovation and you know, we don't want it in totally extreme, but equally it's kind of fun and it gives people a chance to do something different and yeah, I personally think it's they, they just don't, they, they've got no shame. They've lost their care factor. They've got to live. And um, I had an interview with one of the other parties the other day who said that, um, you know, the whole welfare system is, is has been a bit of a, you know, like probably been quite bad for New Zealanders because instead of being that innovative again or innovative like we maybe used to be, we're relying on that little bit of crappy little bit of money which really you're only just surviving if that mm. but it just is enough to put a dampener on your entrepreneurial spirit like it's yeah I mean it's like you just don't you're not desperate enough to really get out there and and try something and be something but then on the other hand you know for example I'm a small business owner and um taxes it's like oh far out man no. and, <laughs> New Zealand small businesses go flat or die off and um, that was before COVID mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, now what? You know? And, uh, and, and it's too hard like it's the one skill that you don't have that kind of lets your business down you know you can be innovative and enthusiastic um oops. <laughs> oh you sorry my phone has suddenly gone I don't know. Looks like we might have lost her. I'll give her a um, 30 seconds and see if she comes back on, but it looks like she so might have actually hung her phone up by accident. Whoops. Okay, well, you know what, that was an awesome chat. That was Sue Gray from the Outdoors Party and um, just a really interesting chat into what they are doing in their party. And what, yep, looks like, yep, she's gone. Yep, so a good look into what they're doing in there in the Outdoors Party and um, what they want for Kiwis, for New Zealand. And it sounds like they just want to bring us back to, back to the grassroots. And it sounds like they have some answers or some policies for most things but um you might have to dive into them a little bit yourself so i'll link um in this when i'm finished when i'm closed this interview i will link the outdoors party uh policies to this live stream and then you can go and have a look for yourself but thanks sue for coming along and having a chat even though we've lost you um and hopefully we'll get to chat again soon best of luck for uh, upcoming elections and let's hope that you can get in a nelson all right, thanks guys.